minutes if you stream. Well, I don't know. That's what I was going to ask Meg to do, or if I just don't know how to handle that, like, I, or at least say in the comments that there's no comments or in the chat that there's no chat. Oh, there's Meg. If you stream. Wait, I'm going to make Meg. Well, I don't know. That's what I was going to ask Meg to do, oh, or if I just don't know how to handle that, like, uh, or at least. Sorry, that was me. All right, we're almost ready. Um, and I'm going to make Meg co-host. Oh, I did. Um, Meg... I think I'm on, I think I'm co-host because I it signed me into right another account. So, sorry. Um, it, here's the YouTube in the chat. Can you go there and just like say there's no comments or something? I'm not sure what to do, but um, or to go. I don't know. Is that the is that the best way to handle it? We'll try a new way every week until we figure out. Well, the one guy was really mad at me. He was like. I I was in there asking questions. And you oh, got like a fool. We're, well, you don't like leaving anybody hanging. That's, yeah, I, you know, that was unfair. I didn't realize that's how things worked. Okay, anyway, <clears throat> that we're said. Um, Are we ready to launch? Should we just go for it? Yeah, I'm going to hit record and then you can just, All right. as you say, launch. <laughs> Welcome back. It's the terrible anvil again. Beyond SQL and uh, multi, we, this is a full enterprise now. We're on episode 13. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about style and drawing uh, on this episode. I'm here. My name is Jess Rulofson. We're virtually coming at you from the Sequential Artist Workshop. I'm here with my co-host. Wait, I usually get an adjective. Uh, well, I can't think of one. Uh, really? Um, oh, uh, delightful. I, I feel I was trying to not recycle. I feel like I've already called you delightful. Anyway, okay. My name's Tom Hart, and I'm. Happy <laughs> um, I'm just I, regular Tom today. <laughs> um. Well, that's our. Okay. You know, that's our. That's our style. Anyway, so th what are we talking about? We have a lot. Uh, it seems like. It seems like this is a, a big issue. We've made notes, and we're ready. And we want to talk to you about um, this question that comes up sometimes from uh, newer practitioners of cartooning, but I, I've also heard like people have been at it a while and it's something I'm curious about myself, but this idea of style, like how you're drawing kind of looks like your signature. Tom has mentioned that on um, previous episodes, earlier episodes. Um, there's aspirational style, what you <laughs> wish your work looked like. Like if you're on the uh, YouTube or watching a video uh, recording of this, Tom's background is a Mobius background. And I was like, oh, he's the best ever. Um, my background's just a void, but, <laughs> but a blank piece of paper ready, ready to be drawn upon. So there's, uh, yeah, there's this uh, maybe a style expectation that you have for yourself and then what comes out on the page. We've talked about that a little bit also, like dealing with expectations, but we're veering a little away from the philosophical and hopefully more into um, some actionable tips you might be able to uh, use in your drawing practice because most people draw comics. It's totally okay if you make comics that are not drawn, if you're using photos or other types of collage or something like that. Um, but so this can still be for you if you're not a, a person who draws, but, but we are thinking about... Um, what your stuff looks like, drawn or not drawn, um, related to these these uh, factors that might influence. We have we have our desire, our internal desire, what we want our style to look like. But there's also external stuff like, well, how fast do I have to go? There's uh, maybe I don't know. One of our students who's like uh, closer to retirement age was like, I got to get this show on the road. <laughs> there's only so many. <laughs> Ages I can draw. So maybe your mortality uh, or biological clock uh, is, is knocking. Hey, you got to do this at a certain speed. Maybe you have a deadline if you're submitting to an anthology for the sequential artist workshop. Maybe you've got a deadline or you're um, maybe, you know, life is going to get hectic very soon and you see this window and you decide I I'm going to work at a certain speed that you might not normally work at. So speed can certainly influence your style. Also circumstances interior, exterior, like uh, what what rituals you already have uh, in your life, <laughs> like Tom's cat, uh, but also, uh, you know, the obligations you have outside of your art practice and the things that the gardens you're growing socially, like taking good care of your family or your cat. <laughs> Tom just disappeared. <laughs> uh, I'm saying cat a lot because there is a cat on um, Tom's Zoom screen if you're listening to this uh, via 
podcast. Um, there's also the idea of routines, like, and some of those routines might not be rit ritualistic. Like I get my cup of coffee and my paper I like. We're sort of talking about that, but also like, what are the routines that are sort of put upon you like oh I gotta go to work and then my my hour right when I get home is when I draw or I draw after I drop the kids off like what what part of the day can you um, make a regular date with yourself even if it's like 20 minutes or something like that so we could talk about um, daily rituals um, and being regular with those things uh, so I think those things are factors that influence what your style might look like and some of those things you can engineer and sometimes we're uh, I wouldn't say stuck with who we are, but the older I get, the more I'm like, man, maybe this is as good as it's going to get in terms of like my abilities as a drafts person. So I'm like, is that okay? Like, is it, or am I getting worse? Like, I, <laughs> I don't know. And then, yeah, some people have like physical uh, situations with their, their, their drawing flippers. <laughs> There's things that happen. <laughs> There's some 10 digits to take care of. It's, it's crazy out here. Tom, what do you think about all this, this style well, idea? I, I've got an anecdote that I can tell, and it, it actually happened today. Can I tell it? Yes, please. Oh, all right, I just have to get either the cat or the coffee out of the way here. <laughs> uh, the cat yeah. wants coffee. Mike, does, does your cat drink uh, a little bit of coffee? Do, do they like it? Our oh. cat likes uh, likes the coffee. Cat okay. style is a whole other anyway. topic. Um, so... <laughs> I'm, I sort of uh, belong, just joined to this very new songwriting community, kind of like our song network, but it's it's for songwriters, right? And I'm sort of a new songwriter slash whatever musician or something. Um, and I and I joined this brand new place that doesn't exactly have a lot of systems set up yet, and not a lot of uh, spaces for interactions. But I wanted to just sort of announce myself in the current challenge. It's a two week challenge is uh, to do a song that's mostly a list. Mm -hmm. And I coincidentally have already done a list song a couple months ago. And most of most of my songs I do, I kind of try and do them in a day, but lately it's more like it takes two to four days, but it's usually like 15 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. And so I already did this one song and it's a, it's a song I, I sort of wrote after reading the Pokemon encyclopedia to my daughter to, at bedtime a lot. And I was reading these like spells or attacks or whatever these Pokemon characters do. And I was reading them and they were just so funny. And there were two in particular, there was a Pokemon called um, uh, Smoochum. <laughs> and, and that, that Pokemon's attacks were like sweet kiss and mm outer snow and then there was also a pokemon that was called spirit tomb and some of that's a t that pokemon attacks were like nasty plot and spite chant and so i just like made oh janice goldberg's got a good one in the chat so um so i i just sort of put these in a little list and made a little song out of it and the and the music came and this is important too the music came from my phone alarm one day i was like I wonder what those notes are and um and the only reason I do this is because like, sometimes I don't have any other ideas. So like, I'm like, I want to make a, I don't have a song I'm working on now. I've always have, I have a day to four days to work on a song because it makes me feel good. That's why I do it. And those were the ideas I had, Pokemon and LR. <laughs> and so anyway, so over the course of a few days, I did it. And then I, and so by now it's a couple months old. I posted it in this network, but I posted it in the section that is like seeking feedback. That was a mistake. So <laughs> So, so I, so I posted it and, um, and a, a guy, a guy commented, um, uh -oh. and, said, uh, and said, no, no, I'm not going to throw him under the bus. Actually. He's actually all spoiler alert. He's actually right. So a guy commented and said, and said, you know, it sounds like there was like a lot of feeling involved with putting your daughter to sleep and it sort of comes out in the song and maybe you could, um, play into those feelings a little more. And then at the last thing he said was like, keep working at it. And I was like, keep working at it. It's like, dude, you're messing with my style. My style is I finish it fast and it's a yeah. little nonsensical. Like that's my style. Like don't mess with my style. And I was really mad. And I realized like, I realized two things. One is like, I actually like that style because I feel like I was born that way. Like I literally feel like I came out suddenly and nothing makes sense. So like a song that, that works the same way sort of works with my understanding of reality. But also I, I realized that um, I've been in hundreds of 
art school um, critique rooms. And I've said exactly those same sort of things, especially mm. to a young art student. And I would say, I would say like, there's really something going on here. Look at what you could have done. Keep working at it. And, um, and the students say the exact same thing I said, which is like, no, that's my style. <laughs> but when you're a young art student, you don't get to say that. You're, when you're a young art student, I think you need to keep pushing, keep trying new things and the style comes. You don't get to say, no, my style is a half asset and it's in, uh, it's in, graf you know, uh, spray paint and pencil and, you know, like, no, keep trying other things and see if there are other feelings you can get to and other, other end points you can get to. And like, to me, that's a, that's a teacherly thing to advise. Um, but actually, you know, I'm, I'm much, much older and I'm, happy at the moment with my songwriting style <laughs> but anyway so that's that's the anecdote but it's like but so 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 i think the point the point to to understand is like early on sometimes we think i have to have a style or i have a style both of which are probably too it's probably too early to to sort of worry about that and what's better is that terrible anvil like keep making things keep making things on a deadline and later reflect, look backwards and see what style you, is yours. And then work on it, develop it, let it let it be part of you. Anyway, I, I've gone on a long time. There's a lot more I could I say. Agree. But... I agree. I agree. I don't think, and I've made this analogy before about baking where it's like, we don't ask very much of the things that we pull out of the oven. We're like, is it edible? It does, or if it's delicious, that's amazing. It's so delightful. What a, what a treat. On a variety of levels but uh i'm not like well what's your baking style or like i mean maybe some like very snooty foody cook, cook type chef bros might have a conversation like that but generally most of us are just trying to keep our bodies alive and like not poison ourselves and like this smells fine and i'll cook it and i will feed myself and my family so uh we don't we there's things that we ask of art that are they're so um demanding and i, I like that i like i like that we're we want a lot out of something like that that's coming from ourselves and being influenced by other things too. Um, but, but also on the other hand, like maybe, maybe it's fine. <laughs> and I put in the chat, like the older I get, the, the less time I spend on drawing. I'm just like, ah, this is good. Yeah, this is great. It's so, it's, you know, so it does feel like this, this area of privilege where like, but yeah, in the classroom, exactly. I'm like, let's spend a little more time on this. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, when you have a deadline and it, it's got to get done, there's also choices that need to be made. And I, made and a, a lot of uh, cartoonists I work with, and myself included, sometimes it can be very uh, agonizing to make choices. Oh, should this be watercolor or uh, maybe it's black and white? And sometimes you have a bunch of different things that you're really great at. And sometimes you understand the language is going to come out in um, if you're multidisciplinary, like, for example, Ross Gay, who we talked about on the last podcast, he's an essayist and a poet. And I went to a reading of his and he gets asked this all the time, like, when you have an idea, do you know if it's a poem or do you know if it's an essay? And he's like, oh, yeah, right away. I, I, it's sort of the idea is paired with the form and I just do it. Mm. And he never has a case of mistaken identity. And I feel like a lot of artists I know are like, well, I don't know. I just kept kind of doing it. And then I figured something else out or, you know, it's like being in a car and going on a road you're not super familiar with. It's just the landscape changes as you're doing the process, like, like Tom said. So just, I do think um, it's interesting to ask yourself what kind of style you would like and good to do that. But also I do think it's going to emerge whether you like it or not. <laughs> and hopefully you like it, but yeah, I, I, it might be also a question of that inner critic thing. Like maybe, being curious about it and and driving towards a certain type of style you like, but also being okay with um, what's coming out on the page and knowing that if there's something that you don't love about it, that it could change in the future. Like it is, it is possible that things could improve <laughs> or get worse. I don't know. In my case, I'm like, I don't know if I'm getting better. <laughs> if I can tell two more personal anecdotes, I'll, I'll make these shorter. Um, one is that, you know, here at Saw right now, we're just doing lightweight 30-day draw up one plant a day challenge. And I gave that I, as my excuse to learn Procreate because it's a, something I don't know. So like uh, I've got some limitations now, right? And a deadline. I've got a daily deadline. And the limitation is I have to draw a plant. And the other limitation is I have to draw it on Procreate. A, play, a thing I have no style in, like it, I, I'm uncomfortable with it. Um, I'm, I don't like what's coming out, <laughs> but I'm 13 days in. No, I'm 11 days in. I'm 11 days in now. 
and in every one I've been rushed. So there's that deadline, right? There's that terrible anvil. And I look at it and what I'm seeing is, is like, I'm seeing roughness, I'm seeing shapes, I'm seeing color. I mean, they're kind of okay to look at. If I was more compassionate towards myself, I'd be, they're really lovely to look at. Um, but because I'm so, I'm um, because there's so much great procreate art to look at out there, and I'm so invested in being one of the great procreate artists for no good reason, of course, but I'm so invested internally with it. I look at it, I'm like, oh, especially when I'm in the middle of it. But after a couple of days, I look at, I look at all of them. I'm like, oh, that's kind of nice. It's, you know, um, I'm watching my own style emerge. It's largely a rushed style. So it's not well considered and it's not, um, you know, let's, let's call it half-assed, but it's also, you know, it's got some pleasing elements to it. And if I want to develop it further, I know where to start. You know, I would start with changing the variables that I'm unhappy with. You know, I might make some cleaner, some cleaner shapes rather than these really rough shapes. I might um, broaden my palette to a little more than three colors, which is pretty much what I'm doing. Things like that. I was, um, uh, you're in luck because I don't remember what the other anecdote was. <laughs> <laughs> I know that happens anytime when I'm like, I'd like to make three points. I don't know how those <laughs> TED Talks will do it. They clearly practice and have no cards. That's fine. Um, but riffing on what you were saying, I, I was thinking about um, like, yeah, having a plan and not having a plan. And also like, I, I think I started working in nonfiction comics because I, I was not convinced of my abilities as a writer. And I was afraid to write about myself a memoir as a young person I was like oh, no one wants to hear a young person talk about their life it sounded really lame and then of my fiction I was like I don't even know how to do that I don't know anything about story um and then I taught a story class at Saul last year so I guess I learned something in in uh getting my MFA in creative writing but anyway uh so so I think a lot of that was like me being a little timid or or understanding maybe where my edges were and my interests were and what my strengths were. I was like, well, what, what can I already work with? Oh, well, I'll just get other people to write the words, which seemed to be less work. It's, I think it's a different type of work, but I noticed the, the more I work with other people, it's almost as if, this is going to sound dramatic, but it's almost as if I want to disappear completely. Like I don't want my work to be super stylish, but I also don't want it to be like, not as good as the prose. And I and I, I think the the stories I try to illustrate rather, uh, you know, I had an illustration background, so it kind of makes sense that I treat cartooning a bit like illustration, but the stories I'm trying to illuminate via comics that have been written by other people or stories that are told by other people, um, I don't want to add to or subtract from the things that they're saying. I, I want to just like try to make it slightly better in that it's like more true or something like that but it can't be super fancy I don't think and maybe that's a cop-out maybe that's just me being lazy but it was something that came to me as as Tom was sharing like maybe I just wanted to not not even be style less but just not be super noticeable and I, I think I realized that it's not the style isn't valuable it's just like it takes forever to draw comics and then people read them quite fast or much faster than it takes in the time it takes to draw them. So when I realized that, I was like, oh, maybe no one's paying attention to my style but me. <laughs> like maybe, or I, I might have said this on the last call or in a different call this week. Uh, I, I know I have cartoonist friends that will read uh, comic books or graphic novels twice. They'll read it once for the information and then they'll go oh. back and enjoy the gorgeous art. And I, I remember reading, um, what was it? Juliet by Camille Jordi. And um, it's it's a graphic novel done in watercolor. And I was going to teach a watercolor class at Saw. So it was like really trying to figure out how she was doing it. But the story was so just wonderful and really excellent. So I was also trying to figure out how did she engineer this awesome story. So it was like reading it and taking photos of the, of the panels at the same time with my phone. So I was like, oh, I can just like go through my camera roll later and stare at these and zoom in and enjoy the watercolor effects because like it was too much to try to figure out in one pass. I think to some degree when we're in the middle of a project style is it's basically um, what's worked before like it's just the yeah. choices that we've made that have worked before and we we're not we're not even really able to think that it is our style it's just like if you're under any kind of pressure whatsoever, and I think everybody is, <laughs> but yes. but 
if you're under any pressure, you just make choices that have worked before. And if you've given yourself a, a, some training, um, then hopefully you have a few answers, right? And you always develop a few more with every project. And so sometimes our, sometimes that style, again, is what has worked before, but maybe there's just this part of you that wants to throw a little something else in there. And you don't know what that is. That's just like, I wonder if this time I could add this or something. But largely it's, mm -hmm. this has worked before. And, you know, we all know artists are all, feel this way about certain kinds of artists and whatever medium when they get too comfortable with their style it's just like oh it's another so-and-so song or so-and-so comic mm -hmm. or, oh, yeah not put they're not quote pushing themselves or or right. you know so so as a as a creator you know we have to walk that line between quote finding that style and again that's young people as young art students i see do that a lot where they're like they try and settle on a style early um but it's not a great idea. It's better to do a lot of work and figure and, and to reflect on what has worked. Yeah. So and I feel like if, if uh, style and process are a Venn diagram, sometimes people will just treat it as the same circle. They'll think like style and process is the same thing. And they are really interchangeable, but especially if you're a younger person, I think you want to get hooked on style. So it's easier to like market yourself and, and be a kind of brand uh, in a space and, and have an audience, but also like, it just gives you a little more confidence if you're like, oh, I have to work on a new thing or I want to work on a new thing. That that existential question I always have at the beginning of everything I ever do is how will I ever accomplish this? <laughs> and, uh, and if the answer is like, oh, I have this recipe of style that I normally use that worked last time. I'll, I'll start there at least. And then when I get bored, I could change the medium or parameters or something. It, uh, I, I think it helps you. As a young person, I could see confidence being really valuable. I just assume everyone has a lack of confidence yeah. so this is not for the people that believe in themselves <laughs> uh if, if you maybe yeah that's a different podcast i don't know <laughs> i i got another idea about style i want to run by you and that's like um like in all of my books i've done, I've done so many comics and um and uh i'm usually unhappy with the drawings right most of us are to some degree but uh, but i almost always I'll be in a room with some friend. I, I remember this with Emma once and uh, we were just looking at one of them and I was like, and it was like, you know, maybe a hundred page comic. And I was like, yeah, there are two good drawings in there. <laughs> and they're like, come on. I'm like, no, there are two. And I'll tell you what they are. And it's this one on, you know, on page 29 and this one. On, and they're like, but what about these? They look the same or they look kind of, and I'm like, no, they're not as good. And I realized that part of it is what I think is going on there for me is that those drawings, the ones that I really think worked, because because uh, stylistically the others look the same, right? They I stylistically, when Emma or whoever whoever says this is just as good, this is just this drawing is just as good. What I'm seeing is is that that's that one time where I drew what it felt like I wanted, mm. what I drew what I what what it feels like. For me, that's what I was going for, and I'm usually going for. Other people are shooting for something that's in their head. I don't have very visual um, imagination, I don't think. And I know that that's when they feel most satisfied is when they draw that thing that's in their head. Thank God I don't have that. Otherwise, I'd always be disappointed. But when I when I managed to draw something that 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 looks like what I felt it should look like or something like that, it's hard to describe. Because I think my, I understand. You know, yeah. So it's also like the feel, the feeling like, um, like, so ver versus like an idea in your mind of an image and what that image should look like, you're thinking about what that moment the image is describing feels like to that character, as well as like how it would feel to draw it on the page or one or the other. Or the, more the former about yeah, what it yeah, yeah. feels like as the character, because in that moment I am the yeah. character and then, or the characters and, and I am part of that landscape, yeah. whatever. And what I is think that? you said that really well. Yeah. I think about that too. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Every once in a while, I get it, but very rarely. And so my desire to either improve is like just trying to get that ratio up a little higher. Yeah. <laughs> just like, yeah, that, I think I that, yeah, find, finding some uh, barometer that's not like, is this good or bad? But like, oh, is this like kind of clocking the vibe <laughs> I'm going for, for lack of a more yeah. articulated phrase? Yeah. And, you know, on this podcast and me and you both, we always advocate for people for like being okay with what comes out and being okay with our limitations and, and, 
and loving loving the artists we are now and i feel that way too but there there is that mo there are those inklings right those feelings that like this could be better what does that mean right how can it how can it be better for me that's what it means it means like i can draw just a little more closer to what i feel and that does keep me moving and it does keep me want to wanting to um quote get better and yeah so yeah so that's what that's that's what keeps me going it, moments it, in the drawings too that you, go ahead Tom, i'm sorry oh i was just gonna say that's what keeps me challenging myself a little bit yeah i think there's moments in the drawing too that you don't plan out and then you're delighted or surprised by it in, in the i'm riffing on what you said where you're like oh those two. what could this be could i do that and you're like wow that's a really cool idea or i that came out better than i thought it would when i do the preliminary thumbnail sketches sometimes i'll kind of classify subconsciously or consciously oh that's going to be an easy panel because it already looks so fantastic or this <laughs> this is going to look really weird because they haven't figured out the background and it's always the opposite of what I think that the part that like looked great in the thumbnails starts to look strange in a cleaner iteration and then the things that seem really problematic start to get better or or it's all a mess <laughs> and I'm like oh I was wrong about everything um yeah it's interesting but I, I think they're there is so funny I I, I uh, have had the opportunity to work with these editors at the Boston Globe in the last comic we did the final scene uh features a salad prominently and I don't get up in the morning thinking man I want to draw lettuce uh, I was just like, oh, this is a comic about the hospital. There's going to be IVs and gurneys and doctors and nursing scrubs and, you know, that stuff. So I wasn't really thinking about salad, even even though uh, I think it was in the script and we, we knew it was going to be in there. But the last scene that I draw a bunch of these bits of lettuce, I really love the way the drawing looks. <laughs> And uh, I had to give an artist talk back in January and just, I put all these slides up that are like, I'm trying to like devise a narrative about my artistic trajectory to date, which is sort of a fable in itself because like it, none of this was planned. It was all just one thing led to another and I got to try to tie a bow around it. But the very last slide is like the salad drawing. And I was like, it was so great. And I'm trying to describe how like life altering this lettuce was for me. And everyone's looking at me like, I don't, I was just like, oh. and it's uh, I just got a photo reference and it's this piece of spinach leaf, but it's just twisted in the right way. And it's just, oh, it's so satisfying to look at it. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of. <laughs> And I spent my entire life like trying to get likenesses right and being really into portraiture and trying to figure out backgrounds, like these more complicated things. I was like, it turned out it was lettuce this whole time. <laughs> but on your topic of like showing Emma your graphic novel of over 100 pages of mediocre drawings and being like, only two of these are good. I recently shared my graphic novel with the um, comics class I'm teaching at a uh, nearby college. And They've been reading critically uh, comics all semester, sort of as a literature class, and we talk about why it's good or why it should be a comic or panel transitions, like how what how is it working on a sort of reading level. And uh, so I got to talk about my work, and I, I've tried to teach my graphic novel before, and none of the students ever have anything to say because they think <laughs> they're nervous to tell me what they think or something. So I, I was just trying to like help them uh, kind of get through, but there's this one drawing I did of a cat that's in invisible wounds and the cat looks like it's a thousand years old it's got like a really long neck and its hair is messed up and I didn't do any of this intentionally I think it is a slightly older cat but it was very handsome in real life it was not the way the drawing looked so I just I kind of just I wasn't like roasting myself the entire time but part of the lecture turned into me pointing out all the things I didn't like that I had drawn I was like look at this cat isn't it crazy but it was it was a way to encourage them also because they're not uh, explicitly like um, people that are art majors and they draw comics every week in our class and the stuff that they draw is kind of fabulous um so you could still tell it was a cat, but it's, I feel ashamed because I'm a big cat person and I was like, I, I could have done better. So I, ho I hope in the future I get, I think not this comic I'm working on, but the next one, I get to draw the cat that I have. So I'm hoping I can redeem that bad drawing. <laughs> I don't know. On the subject of the salad and the surprise, like I think for me, surprise is a big uh, a, a, a value that I really... Well, something I really value. Um, and so like there are, there is a lot of like attempts to surprise myself or, or yeah, that's it. I keep, I keep looking for more words, but, but 
it's true that like what I was saying about like trying to draw what what the feeling is, some of that's up for debate even as the process is going on, right? Like I'm not really sure what what the feeling is, what the characters what the moment is for the character and for the landscape, you know, sometimes I want to, there's a little bit of a surprise I'm hoping will come at me. Um, so I, I, I do want, I do want to insert that into the dialogue because, because those drawings I'm happiest with aren't the ones that were like conceived in feeling and then, and then done properly, you know, to, to mimic it. it the, it's such a, it's such a fluid process where, where you're, where you're working and you're like, oh, look at the way those rocks came out. I didn't even know they were going to be rocks. I thought they were, yeah. thought, they were I thought they were tree stumps there or something. But, and I don't know, maybe that's how your salad worked. I don't know. I, I like that idea. Like, I think I said that we have a, a, a wonderful group of year long program students. And this is the time of year where they're in their fourth quarter, which sounds like we're, we're watching football. I'm like, they're going to win. They're going to do it. And they're, they're working on a comic for the anthology, six page comic six-ish let's say <laughs> some of us are doing seven and uh and I don't know I, I forget who it was on the call but they said I don't know what I'm doing or I don't I don't know what I'm doing and it was like kind of a thought that was disturbing them and I was like yeah knowing what you're doing is overrating overrated which I think is funny because Tom and I are like let's tell you what to do as cartoonists uh and here is I mean we we do want to help you get useful advice that we think here are our mantras or little things that get us through the day or the evening or whatever. So that, that part is true, but also at, at um, I think at a lot of turns, knowing what you're doing is really overrated, um, <laughs> which isn't the case. Like, I mean, <laughs> if you're driving a car, it's nice to know what you're doing <laughs> or like uh, performing a dental surgery. It's good to like have a ballpark. Right. So I do think knowledge is power for, for sure, <laughs> but also uh, like a hyper explicit roadmap is also useful, but there are different types of information. I think I think if you're led by curiosity as well as like previous results, but kind of wiggling and, and noodling your way towards it versus like staying rigid. Um, maybe the disadvantage of this podcast is Tom and I don't always disagree, but I feel like on some of these bigger points, we're like, yeah, yeah, man, you just gotta like figure out what the character's feeling and then like draw it the way that that would smell. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> so like 80 percent of our audience out there is like no who are you i need the rules yeah. so we're i i uh thanks for being with us is all i mean to say yeah yeah this is the midway point where we say thank you to thank everybody you. sticking it out um but I, I love you said being led by curiosity that's a really important part of art making i think and even if the story is one we feel like we already understand um even if the panel we're mapping out feels like we already know it like yeah being led by curiosity because there's probably always a little more, a little broader an understanding that can come, even just to you as as the artist, as the sort of like person that is transmitting the the story or something like that. I'm really hung up on. Um, well, this is the anti-capitalist part of the conversation. I'm really <laughs> Yay! I was waiting for it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad. Not... Okay, for our folks at home. Do not start a drinking game based on at what point we'll start talking about the capitalism monolith. Well, you know, I, but I, but you know, I'm I'm really fixated lately on um, all the ways in which we interact and how prescribed they all are, and how much more prescribed they're getting, right? And so, what what I mean by that is, well, first of all, our, our language, the language you and I are speaking in at the moment is a prescribed language. And, and it's extremely useful because we can get a bunch of people in a room and a bunch of people online and we can, you and I can communicate and everybody knows what we're, we're saying, right? So that's like, so a written and a spoken language is great. An art language is so much deeper, or I think can be, I think is, I'm going to say it. <laughs> you know what? Draw that line in the Mobius sand. Yeah, yeah in the Mobius sand, there it is. Um, uh, you know, an art language is so much deeper and has so much potential to actually add, really render our reality um, in, a, in a deeper way. And that involves a, that involves curiosity. That involves a really open sense of realizing that we don't understand everything and there's more to come and there's more to understand. Um, and we don't we won't even know, like we won't even have words for it, maybe when we do when that understanding does come to us. Right. And our hearts broaden and our experiences broadens and I don't know now I'm just you know but anyway 
And it's anti capitalist I mean, because because uh, all you know, social media says do it this way, and you'll get. And language says do it this way, and I'm saying do it the beautiful, curious way. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I'm writing. Don't be prescriptive in the chat. Uh, yeah. Like I don't know what you were saying sounded really lofty. Like uh, what if <laughs> what could it be? What is it? How deep and beautiful and meaningful it might be, and these these possibilities that you've encountered as real in your practice, and you're like, this is why this is awesome. There are lots of reasons, but here's one thing I love about making comics, and I'm also like, maybe it's the flip side of the same coin, but I feel like it's much more lowbrow. And then I'm like, I love. I, maybe I'm just basic, and I'm like a vanilla latte Starbucks lover uh, in terms of like the whatever the comics equivalent is of that, but or pumpkin spice even, like. Uh, I love a visual metaphor that's almost bad. Like I'm like, but what if we draw this? Or like, it's not this, but it's this other thing, but it kind of looks like this. I'm, I don't, I can't really give you a clear example. Or for example, like I, I drew this comic last yeah. week that was, uh, it had a lot of violence in it. I mentioned it in the last episode and I, there's an opportunity to play with metaphor. And I was like, instead of these powerful characters where I'd have to maybe draw portraits and these people are potentially criminals. So I was also like, I don't, I don't know. Like it starts to get uh, ethically complicated. And I don't have time for that because I have a deadline. So I was like, all right, instead of real people, and I love portraits, but how would I draw chickens here? Because there's a pecking order. And uh, to be fair, uh, cockfighting was referenced earlier in the story. So I was like, ah, it all ties together. Uh, and it was just like deeply satisfying, but also like so cheap and ridiculous. If if you if you're really like a highbrow PhD level thinking about the possibilities uh -huh. of art, I was like chickens. I'm <laughs> brilliant. So uh, I mean, is it the same side? Is it the same coin, different side, or am I talking about a different a chunk no, of change? <laughs> no, it's the same thing because you're you're broadening our you're broadening our understanding of the story by bringing a little levity into it, you know, and it's not a specific kind of levity. It's a weird kind of levity. That's kind of hard to describe, you know, yeah. and, and that's what our existences are so complicated and it's so wonderful to be allowed to have a multiplicity of reactions and feelings about them. And it's, just, and that's what, that's what you can do as an artist, but boy, are we still stock talking about style or what? Oh, yeah. What are we talking about? Now? Well, I was also <laughs> thinking about literalism. Like sometimes it can be quite literal in a conversation with somebody if we're talking about language and visual language and, and uh, spoken language and, uh, and, and, and be really rigid in the way that I'm thinking about something, but there are opportunities in drawing where I'm like, there's an other side of me that delights in puns. Unfortunately, Tom knows this and some of our longtime yeah. saw people know that I love a pun and um, there's not a lot of opportunity to do the wordplay <laughs> thing in like, you know, depressing <laughs> stories. This nonfiction journalism thing is uh, it's for the birds. I keep telling Tom I want to draw butts. So knowing my luck, it'll be like some proctologist approaches me. He's like, I'm going to draw like a real butt. And I was like, no, no, not that kind of butt. I want like a fun butt, fun butts only. And uh, one of my uh, students in, in the mentorship had, had mentioned a couple weeks ago that she's interested in having fun only. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't always happen in the drawing process where there is a little bit of a struggle. It's not like we want to be carefree, but yeah, frolicking was also mentioned last episode or the one before. Where do we get to run amok with articles of clothing missing? Like, <laughs> Wait, are we... Are we still talking I don't know about what we're talking about, Tom. Um, follow the Mobius footprints in the sand uh, in your background. <laughs> Where are we going? I've got a couple more. This is this is going all the way back to art school again. I've got a something that's worth pointing out. Um, and I, I've seen it happen over and over again. And it's worth it's worth. Um, I think anybody can experience this. And that's that's when you've got a deadline, you've got an assignment, you're trying to do it the right way. And you look at the way, well, I'll, I'll just be specific. Here's what, here's what happened with me. I was making these comics and I was making them what I thought was the right way. <laughs> and I would, so I would sketch them out first in my sketchbook with these like loose noodly characters. And then I would like get on the proper paper and I would try and do it the right way. And it was just so hard and I couldn't do it. And um, and I looked at that those like noodly characters in the sketchbook. I was like, wait, why am I not doing it that way? Why mm -hmm. is the, why, you know is this noodly 
thing in my sketchbook might be who I really am. And what if I just try that? And I think everyone, a lot of people experience that at some point where they realize like, oh, I've been trying too hard to do something else. But when I'm left to my own devices, those of us who are free enough to be left to our own devices sometimes, sometimes we have so many voices in our head, we're never left to our own devices and that's a problem. But some of us who, you know, if we have the, a moment to reflect and realize like there's a, there's a casual way in which we start, there's probably the seeds in our, of our style in that, you mm -hmm. know, we can, and that's where, when we should start there rather than, um, I mean, again, I always pull out like, um, you know, Billy and Tamaki or Emily Carroll were extremely talented cartoonists on the graphic novel shelves these days. And they're like, I would love to draw like Billy and Tamaki. It's never going to happen, you know, but I can draw like noodly old me and slowly over decades play with it and, and, and let it grow into some sort of like, my, in, a, in a way, because I've been doing it for so long, like my style is like another version of me. And I get to like live this weird second life where this other cartoon language exists next to you know in parallel with whatever the heck my me and my body are doing <laughs> it's weird i know but but like it's fun to have this like this visual self you can play with and expand and settle into and all these other things as as you go on and again then that's pulling it back again to to granting yourself the time to develop style yeah, I, I think style is always something that feels like you're chasing after it or it's something that's in development. And those things are true. But I like the idea of being like, what if I, I've had the style within me this whole time? Right. Uh, it's right here on the page. Uh, like, that's really cool, too. And I, I think the older I get, the more I'm like, this is it. <laughs> like, uh, this is what it looks like. You're welcome. Like, rather than being apologetic about it, not being the thing that I thought it was going to be. I'm just like, take a bow. Yes, it is here on the paper. Uh, and I don't know <laughs> if that's like a defense mechanism, but uh, I'm going to roll with it and say it's positive and intentional. And that's how I want it to look. Um, well, that's yeah, the, uh, the old phrase that's like, um, keep giving them you until you is what they want. Yeah. Do you ever get uh, compliments, Tom, on your personal style, like the way you dress? Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I don't know, because I was trying to it. find another, you know, I love a metaphor. So I was, I mean, sometimes I, I give you compliments, um, not because you're my boss, but I, I you know, I, you have interesting articles of clothing. I think you have uh, a, a personal style. Like if we got off the call and we're tasked with trying to draw people on the call from memory, like I, I was like, oh, well, Tom has glasses and maybe I'll, I'll draw that face coming out of the side of your head <laughs> but that's like kind of part of your style like if you were another person I'd be like oh I feel uncomfortable for them but I'm like oh Tom looks great with two heads I'm totally great <laughs> um so I, I don't know but I, I was wondering about that like sometimes and I don't know if a lot of people have given me compliments on to the point where oh my gosh I love your style like if you see someone repeatedly enough to notice that like oh they don't just have a good outfit they they have style um I don't know how much that translates but um maybe <laughs> tom and i are not the style icons we wished we were but uh i don't know no well i mean no it, it does translate i think but i think you're much better at it than i am i i actually i mean style if you're going to talk about personal style if you're going to talk about um dress and appearance and things like that it's um it's a performance just like anything is a performance anything in, in the real world is, is a performance and it's a performance I'm really bad at and kind of ignore like I just don't try because yeah, it, and, and then like it takes a lot of effort it's 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 just akin to keep giving them you until you is what you want you're like well sometimes your style is bad style or or whatever it is like if you if you wanted to define it by those parameters like this is what it is it is a style uh even if it has intention or it doesn't it still kind of comes across as something that is habitual or, or regular or something that keeps emerging. Carol had a question for us in the chat. Can you talk about the pros and cons of comparing someone's style to some specific artist? I think like comparing your own style maybe to another artist. Like Tom, why don't you draw like Charles Schultz? Don't you want to draw like him? It, the funny thing is, is I... I uh... Not to weaponize that information against you. <laughs> oh, you're wounding me. Um, that is a... Uh, um... But Walt Kelly is the artist I always wanted to draw like, at least when it 
became a, a little a little more aware of all the of the cartooning possibilities. Walt Kelly is the artist of Pogo, and it's so rich and so fluid. Um, you know, Bill Watterson's wonderful too, but I, for some reason, I don't think I don't know why Walt Kelly particularly. I respond to it, but I see it and I'm, and, and a part of my, part of me thinks I could do that. And another part, of, most of me says, no, you can't, you've tried for 30 years. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, like that ship has sailed, Tom. <laughs> yeah. but, but there's always, so, but, but there's always the, there's always the, the desire. So it has to do with feeling again. Right. And it has to do with response. I respond to that Walt Kelly artwork in such a way that, in, in a way I can't I exactly quantify. And so my desire to sort of get a little bit closer to that Walt Kelly style is my desire to like um, grasp those feelings a little more strongly. Those feelings mm -hmm. that I get when I look at Pogo and those feelings that I get when I occasionally make a nice pan. <laughs> and um, so you just have to get really used to not hurting yourself about it because you never hit those goals, which none of us do. Even Justine, who's a great stylist, um, never, you know, she had to eventually say like, you know, I, I, I am who I am and this is what comes out and it's brilliant and, and really immaculate in a lot of ways, but there's certain things that are different than her, that her, her mentors and her, um, her idols. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, how do you feel? Do you have a Walt Kelly or a, uh, Jillian Tamaki or <laughs> well I was thinking of this time I, I was uh, pretty young I had just started college in Alabama and I was majoring in painting and the um, primary painting instructor is a small uh, college with a small art department he was very good and he was sort of the reason I had gone to that college other than it was close by and I could like afford <laughs> the loans I was like oh this isn't too expensive and um I hadn't really seen his work. He just had a reputation that he was a good teacher and he could paint. And I was like, I want to learn how to paint. So this is the guy I should go study with. There also aren't a lot of <laughs> art programs in Southern Mississippi. So I was like, ah, oh, deal sold. So uh, and I think it was the first semester I was at college. He had a one person show in town at a really nice gallery. And it wasn't even in the section of town where there were a lot of galleries. So it, it, I think it may have even been at like a neighboring college or something. So the space itself, I remember being remarkable, but I remember walking in and he had done um, these uh, panels of paintings. It was funny because it's almost like a comic, but it, it was one image built up out of several panels and the panels were pretty big, but, uh, but the whole piece itself had this kind of physical presence um and the painting itself was also just really lovely and he does oil painting on um metal um sheets of metal basically so it has this luminosity i mean everything about it was undeniable it was just this amazing thing and i as soon as i saw it i was like i should probably drop out of college <laughs> like i had only been studying art for a very brief time officially and i and, I, and nothing i mean i was unflappable i was like i'm i'm the best at everything and i can do it and i'll get even better and I saw this and I was like, well, I better quit now because <laughs> this guy's really good. And it was it was the first time I had kind of felt that way or, or encountered greatness that was so amazing that I was like, oh. and he's he's like just completely uh, absent of ego. He's just like very chill, just love, very curious about painting itself. And oh, what what happened if I do this? So I think uh, hopefully I learned some of my good habits from him to uh, stand curious and, and not having too big of an ego. But uh, so when I got over that, <laughs> I was like, oh, so I, I think sometimes when we, when we compare our work to something like that, that's like, just like, wow, just expansive, uh, or just, just tapping into some other thing. It's, it's amazing to, to, it's like a veil is lifted and you're like, wow, I didn't even know that was possible. And so you see the world a little bit differently. It is hard not to uh, internalize that as like, there's no way I'll ever be that good. But on the other hand, um, I think I realized like, maybe that's not the point of the thing that I'm trying to do. And I don't know, um, like there might be value in other things uh, and not in a way of like, uh, I have to let that dream go. Like maybe one day I will become as good as him. I haven't really been painting, so I don't know what the odds are. But um, but I I think uh, it's just another opportunity to be dazzled, and there are different ways we dazzle ourselves. Um, 
like, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not always like, wow, this is an amazing one person show that took decades to develop, uh, not style, but also execution too, like really going for it. I think sometimes we quit before we start because like, um, you know, what it might require of us. <laughs> it's too scary. Uh, but I don't know. I, I think there's just things about it that we can't plan. I feel like I'm getting really abstract, but Well, now would be the time to get actionable because I know we used that word early on. Yeah. So what, how, how you said, you know, we can dazzle ourselves. Is that, is that an outcome we're looking for or is, is the outcome to be comfortable with ourselves to, or is Get that comfortable with dazzling yourself. How about can be both? <laughs> <laughs> All Start right. getting used to it. You're amazing. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's two things. I think you can be maybe uh, ritualistic to the point of not being obsessive. Hopefully, it depends on what what area. Of All right, hold on. What, what do you mean by that? Like, uh, ha okay, show up and do the work. It sounds unglamorous, but like, uh, I think we put the wrong pressure on ourselves. I have to draw like, uh, I don't know, Da Vinci for lack of it. Let's say I want to draw like Mobius. Mm -hmm. showed up however many hours a day and into the work so like if i'm not showing up it, it is really a, a maybe like wishful thinking but if, if you devote a little bit of time on a regular basis if not a daily basis uh to what it is you're trying to do the thing that you want to do should emerge from the hours you're clocking eventually and if that specific vision doesn't emerge other good things it will bear fruit because you put in the The time that's what i believe so so just being consistent it, even if like your medium is not consistent and your drawing is all over the place and your character continuity is off the rails um that's that's all like stuff that like could potentially be resolved later if you just keep showing up and drawing stuff and being okay with where you're at right now um i don't know uh the i mean it's that that is a little abstract but it's somewhat actionable and that like if you put clock a few more hours The other thing that the the painter teacher that I had that was like sort of amazing and dazzled me, uh, he had some good advice. He's like, when you get to a point in a painting, I think we were asking, what do you do when you just want to quit this painting because it's not going right? He's like, oh, I just tell myself I'm going to work 10 more minutes on it. And then at the end of the 10 minutes, I work 10 more minutes. <laughs> and then at the end of the 10 minutes, I work another 10 minutes. So like 30, 10 minutes turns into 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Uh -huh. And then he'll get to another place where he feels a little bit. better versus stopping when it feels the worst um so so paying attention to like we you have to put down the pencil and sleep and, and uh, eat stuff and do other things you can't draw incessantly for 24 hours seven days a week but um when you stop might also give you uh there, there uh are who is it graham green i think religiously wrote 500 words a day and would stop in the middle of a sentence If he was like, oh, that's 500, and he would go and just like drink all night and sleep with other people's <laughs> partners. He had a lot of extracurricular activities that I don't know whether or not they're related to how good he's at writing, but he was he was committed to this 500 word a day goal, which is far less than like Stephen King or something like that. But um, maybe it's quality <laughs> over quantity. No, no, no dig on Stephen King. He's amazing, but um, but yeah. So like just whatever it is that's consistent that you're regular with, do that. The the Gustave Flaubert quote I always. forget is be regular and ordinary in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. So just kind of having your regular thing, if that's like, I have a little corner of my room that I work in a certain time of day that seems to work the best, a cup of tea I really enjoy, a door that shuts, <laughs> noise canceling headphones, uh, a babysitter, whatever you need. Uh, I don't know. So I, I think whatever th those things are, if you can experiment with that, that helps. Uh, trying to go a little bit faster than your inner critic in terms of drawing, like practicing drawing faster and drawing worse essentially kind of takes the burn off of like, oh, this is going to look really bad or this doesn't look great. I noticed for myself personally, when I started drawing faster, I didn't get any better. It's just it's like uh, less painful, but it's not like my drawing got better. I just was like, oh, this is fine. And uh, maybe speaking to what Tom said about being noodly and stuff like that. Um, I don't know, like embrace. I don't know. I'm always like embrace mediocrity. I mean, maybe you draw faster and it's fine, but I I don't know how to phrase it without sounding kind of uh, pessimistic. Sometimes you have to lower not your 
Well, talking about the inner critic, right? And like, how do we keep the inner critic from being so loud that we doesn't even let us develop a style, right? It, because because it stops us from working so often. You know, you can't do this. You can't. You know. Um, Isn't there that quote somewhere? I don't know if it's from you or in the salt material somewhere. It says lower your standards so you can reach them. Or you said that like two weeks ago, did but. I say that? I don't know. I feel like I was quoting something you said. That was a summary. But what I was going to say, it's it's related to that, but it's more like um, sometimes you can trick your, it's hard on a long project, especially if you're like, I, I want to, I want to tell a memoir or I want to do this or that. But sometimes you can um, trick your inner critic by telling it that what you're doing isn't important, which is one reason I'm really into this, like 30, draw 30 plants in 30 days on procreate. Cause like procreate isn't important. Plants aren't important. Yeah. And like, so it's like, yeah. Hopefully something nice will come out of it that my inner critic got tricked out of being a jerk about. about. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that um, it doesn't matter in an existential way. It, it doesn't matter enough to be too stressed out about. So you just do it. And it's good. Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing I'm doing. And this is like, you're not supposed to, you're not really supposed to let the cat out of the bag in the beginning of a project when it's so nascent and so brand new. But but like I haven't been drawing much like right for the past year. I've mentioned it before, but I'm starting to draw again. But but like already that inner critic is like, well, you're supposed to be good at this, so make it good, right? And so I'm like, no, like shut up. <laughs> so one way I'm gonna I'm trying to get it to shut up is I'm calling this next project. Like I I, I love the Moomin characters, right? Everyone loves yeah. the Moomin characters. I love the Moomin comic strips. So. One way in which I've let myself sketch a little and doodle a little and not treat it like it's the biggest deal in the world that my inner critic has to be a jerk about is I'm calling it Fumin, which means fake movement. <laughs> and so and so my inner critic can't be a jerk about something called Fumin. It just doesn't work. It's yeah, silly. you're like, this is a cover song. It's right. Fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is silly. Just shut up. You can go do something else because like I'm just doing a silly thing. You don't have to be present. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that like as I sort of play around a little bit, this like whatever Fumin becomes <laughs> becomes something that hopefully I can out, again out, outrun it. It gets enough steam so that the owner critic could be like, oh, interesting. And then Tove Janssen estate will come after you with a copyright <laughs> lawsuit, hopefully. Still working on the noses. I haven't got the noses right. That's but. amazing. I, you asked me something about like, oh, oh like how in answer to Carol's question about uh, how how do you how do you deal with comparing yourself to artists or something like that? Um, and I was saying, oh, I was really dazzled by this artist that I, I had met in real life and I really love their work. I still do. And then I was thinking about, I think I'm dazzled not by my greatness, but by my mediocrity. Like, I'm like, wow. Like, I'm like, look at that. Like, I, I, I'm i sort of, I don't know how to describe it. Like, when I draw the thing that's really silly or it doesn't matter, low stakes, and I just let myself do it that's sort of dazzling i'm like wow i can't believe i can't believe i did that <laughs> like I, I let that one slide <laughs> yeah like not even yeah so maybe it's maybe like my favorite part of the graphic novel is that 100 year old cat <laughs> drew in there right. maybe not quite but there is something about it that was like that was okay too there are other parts of the book that are pure poetry and amazing and then there are other parts i'm like wow okay <laughs> But there's also, and again, it you know it requires some self compassion. But there are there's some parts, and that cat is one of them that are like so Jess that you're just like, I love this Jess thing that you've got going. Oh. You know, this Jess person that you know that draws these wonky cats. It's so awesome. Well, and, and who knows? Maybe there are people out there right now that are like, man, I wish I could draw like Tom Hart. Man, Jess is amazing at drawing. They're out there somewhere. All four <laughs> of them are. <laughs> We're maybe we're someone's Mobiuses. If 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 our standards are low enough, maybe someone else's is even lower. I need no. to think. Of, I'm not sure. I know that's like a dark turn. Sorry. <laughs> or maybe I'm the the low water mark. Someone's like, man, as long as my comics don't look like Jess's, I'll be okay. <laughs> no, I'm not. I gotta. I gotta not worry about what other. I just yeah. I I, I think like the older I get, the less likely I am to compare myself to another artist. I am still really encouraged by the beautiful things other people are making. I'm like, well, that's really cool. I, like, and, and my immediate thought isn't, I could never do that, but that is part of it. Maybe subconsciously it's like, oh, I would never work in oils or, or make a movie the way that Mel Gibson makes movies or something. Cause that's not my medium and he's a very different person than me. Uh, but, but there, yeah, there are things that are um, dazzling in different ways outside of, outside of my 
my expertise, I guess. Uh, so I think I'm maybe a little more forgiving and pragmatic the older I get. I think when I was younger, I expected mm. this, this un, um, maybe unattainable thing from myself. But yeah, but again, you're, so again, you've given yourself the, the gift of a lot of hours. You put in a lot of hours and that in turn has given you the gift of seeing it with some objectivity that, you, and again, you're, you know, I, I sort of made the grandiose statement that your style is this other you, but in a way I, I still stand by that metaphor that like, you've got this, you've got this thing, this entity, even you could call it that, that exists alongside of you and you have no choice, but to be compassionate about it, but also, yeah, treat it well, feed it well. And, and you know, um, and, you know, neither of us are going to draw like Jaime Hernandez. And we know that now, but we can, we can turn, you know, you can turn Jess Rollifson's art and I can turn Tom Hart's art into something that really dazzles our, ourself at least. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully you Good dazzle time. me, Tom. Oh, oh, so that'll be my adjective uh, episode 14, my dazzling. Uh, quote. Okay. I have to remember, everyone remind me. Um, I, I was going to say, oh crap, what was I going to say? You're totally like getting me excited about this idea. What were you just talking about? Oh. Talking about style and come on, this is the I end. can't, I can't draw like Jaime Hernandez. Oh, mm -hmm. damn it. It was so good. I totally forgot. All right. Bring this shut off. <laughs> well, I hope we've, I hope we've, covered some of the ground. oh wait if i have one piece of advice for style i figured it out i just remembered oh. shout out to tom's cat who's here again um finish your projects yeah right. finish them get to the last panel of the last page and write the end and sign it and ideally share it with people but finish your projects because if you don't finish things you're putting yourself in prison and you're gonna feel really bad about yourself and chances are, if you're anything like me, you probably already feel bad about yourself and you don't need any more of that energy in your life. So like, let it stand. Like, don't be afraid for it to turn out in a different way than you think it might. And the more things you finish, the more you your style emerges from that. And also this sort of internalized knowledge of like, oh, well, this is just what comics are that I make enough that you can take some of it for granted. And and um, not be quite so freaked out every second of art making or before you start a project. We all do that. We start a project and we leave it for a couple of hours or a day or two. And by the time I sit down again, I'm like, oh my God, I remember. And then as soon as I get into it, it's fine. But there's this deep anxiety about starting the work and, and then like kind of keeping in touch with it. That's far worse than like making anything crappy or mediocre. So if I, if I have one piece of advice, it's finish the projects you start. And if, if it's like, oh, it's a 600 page graphic novel, it's going to take me several years, have shorter goals or shorter projects or treat each page like a triumph or something like a finish a page. That's a finish. Right. So that you could define finish in, in different ways that are more sustainable. Um, but like, yeah, give yourself some credit. You're doing great. <laughs> OK, uh, I'm going to I'm going to come to you when when I get a couple steps further into into Fumin. What um what what's our next topic for next week what are we talking about um so next week on the terrible anvil episode 14 uh myself will be here oh my gosh i'm trying to get my document to load um <laughs> this one i don't have a clear answer for but it was a question i was asking myself how to start over <laughs> how to start over so how, how to start to... over oh no how to, yeah so how to that can be something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it could, you started a very ambitious project and it stalled out or you put it away or life happened. The other thing is maybe starting over, you finish a project, you feel awesome. You, you've done, you followed all our advice and you're like, man, I have style and grace and I'm amazing. And you have an idea for a new project and you're like, oh no, I'm starting over. I have to do it again. Like, so it does, even if you clock the hours, sometimes it can feel like you're starting from the very beginning. Uh, and that can be kind of scary. And you got to learn all those lessons again. You got to, yeah, you got to go through some of those feelings again. Yeah. Okay. That'll be a great episode. Yay. I can't wait. <laughs> a dazzling episode. Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you. <laughs> nice to, nice to talk to you again about style and, and to keep this anvil thing going. And as a reminder, we've got what, seven more episodes we're going to no, Yeah. Seven or eight. And we're going 20 episodes.
Anyway, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's like about the end of May. And our so our timing was a little later today for those of us that joined us live on the call. But we're, we, we do tend to try to record 1 p.m. on Thursdays, but it might move around a little bit as we get further into May because my schedule is changing a little bit. But we'll keep you posted. You can join us on the Saw Mighty Network. Uh, we publish uh, articles and just the regular public feed. So if you go to our website and then click on, I think, community, you can kind of get involved that way and look at the terrible Anvil recaps. Um, and if you have any questions for us, that's maybe the best way to like shout out and give us a question and we'll try to answer them. Um, so we'll see you next week. All right. See you next week. <laughs> Bye, Tom. Bye, Thanks, Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks for everybody. In